Hey, what is going on guys? It's Spunkify here on behalf of MMOBomb.com and welcome back to the Free Play Podcast, episode 92. Today is November 17th, 2013 and we got a really great episode for you. We're guys, you guys, we're going to the beach. We are going to the beach, the sandbox beach that is. We're talking a lot about sandbox MMOs today, dealing with a variety of them, how they sort of choose their own path and how they're actually going about making a new experience for players an immersive emergent gameplay experience emergent seems to be the word of the day when it comes to sandbox mmos coming out but we're going to talk about several of them not just the typical ones and to do that we have our usual lineup of co-hosts with me today jason winter and the always always prevalent uh kevin kevin jason how are you guys doing uh, I'd be doing better if it wasn't for these kind of not so great onion rings I had earlier today. They're, they're definitely weighing on me. Are they? Were they like the the prepackaged ones? Or are no, these it, was, like... it was at a bar. It was a sport. It was at a Buffalo Wild Wings actually. The appetizer. Uh... But they were good. They tasted good, but it might have been a little greasy, and they're definitely still uh, sitting with me like six hours later. That's no good. That's no good. Hopefully, you can power through this this episode I, here. I, if, if, if I go silent quickly, you'll know where I went. You powered your way to the bathroom. All right, Kevin. <laughs> uh, I, I'd be in a in a better mood if my week hadn't been a little bit on the rough side and I wasn't a little tired. But you know, I'm happy to be here. It could, it's getting better. Okay, good. It didn't have anything to do with that semi running into you. No, so, nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Do about with that? The glass smashing all over by my face and yeah. Well, nothing. you're alive, and that's what counts. You know, that's great. There's no. If you weren't, we'd have to find another host, and that would be you know the biggest yeah. concern. Yeah. Yeah, and the, you know what kind of a bind that would put me in? That would just be such a bind. Why don't you think it's of us? So man? nice to know that you guys. I wouldn't be worried about like the emotional toll of just finding another host. I am so touched by that. Yeah, it's the financial responsibility, you know. That's what it is. It's finding Prudent the people. thinking. Prudent thinking. But Kevin, no, we couldn't replace you, of course. And for you guys, we're gonna take you all, you know, out to a nice day at the beach. Gonna get some sand. Come play in my sandboxes. You know, that's sort of like the feeling we got today. We got a variety of sandbox MMOs to talk about. News regarding them. Discussions regarding them. All good sorts of good stuff. Uh, starting a little bit with uh, Gloria Victus. Now, Gloria Victus, for you guys who don't remember, we just sort of introduced it uh, on MMOBomb.com back in July. It's a medieval, realistic medieval, not fantasy-based uh, sandbox MMO that's being developed by a company called, or development studio called Black Eye Games. Uh, and when we originally announced the game, we actually had a fair amount of viewer response. A lot of the players were, a lot of viewers rather, were seeing they really enjoyed how it was looking, what the style was going to be, uh, but they weren't so sure about the animations and what have you. Uh, Jason, Kevin, do you guys actually remember the, the early video that they released on MMO Bomb, or that we released on MMO Bomb with the whole gameplay and the whole action-based aiming combat? Jason, did you get a chance to take that? Check I didn't remember until you, you know, I saw the notes on it, and I looked back at the link, and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah, the animations. Yeah, yeah. I remember talking about that. Yeah. It, it kind of seems like a thing when it comes to survival sandbox MMOs. I mean, I'm. it sort of makes me think about, like, DayZ. DayZ recently had, like, those uh, new gameplay footage came out when the animations were so, like, wonky. That seems like the one of the last things developers get to. Just like, it's, oh. it's hard. I mean, it's hard to make good animations of characters. It's probably expensive as well, and that's what a lot of these games don't have the budget for. True, true. Well, we have some good news for players interested in Gloria Victus. The developers actually contacted us and said, hey, we listened to what your fans had to say when you actually posted that article, and we have some great news in regards to developments in those areas. So the fans were expressing their disinterest in due to the animations and how they wish those could be better, um, and apparently... They were able to get a lot of like big names or a lot of you know well experienced developers added to the team recently. So they got a new member named Der- and I'm gonna butcher this name, but is Jaroso Zeliski to the team. He is an experienced animator that has worked on many games such as Two Worlds Two, Deadfall Adventures, Painkiller, Hell and Damnation, and Necrovision. So. They actually were able to bring in some new talent, some new writers, people who have worked on The Witcher and Bulletstorm uh, to sort of bring life to Gloria Victus. So we should actually start seeing some new animations. And I got to say, you know, this news itself isn't that that huge for the game. You know, new animators bringing on new talent is always great, especially for a team that, to my knowledge, wasn't actually doing this with like a huge like fundraising support. They sort of failed their Kickstarter um, and then they were sort of just doing this on their own dime. 
So I'm always sort of rooting for the underdog, if you will. And it's great to see that they're bringing on some additional talent to, I guess you could say, just listen to the community and do what you know the community wants, which is improve the animations, improve these areas where they feel like is most needed. Um, in the end, uh, I have to ask you, Kevin, Jason, are you guys actually into this type of sandbox MMO? Like as a whole, the idea, the principle of a medieval sandbox MMO, is that a premise? Because we, we sort of have this unprecedented uh, buffet in front of us of free-to-play sandbox MMOs coming out, which we're going to talk about a lot of them today. And this is just one of those offerings. Does it appeal to you guys at all? Or are there things still that you're like, hmm, I'm not sure about? Personally, me, the st- what really bugs me most about the sandboxes is when you have the ability to do almost anything, I hate it when they kind of go where stuff has already been done. Um, um, the whole fantasy kind of medieval stuff, it's been rehashed in so many different games, and I understand that it's never really been done as a sandbox, but there's enough open-ended MMO stuff along those lines that it just doesn't feel like anything new to me. I'd rather just hit a genre that we haven't seen. Maybe it's, Well, there isn't know. fantasy in this. This is supposed to be realistic, okay. like... It's Meta, just you know. still the the medieval side of it. I don't feel like is gonna happen. And then losing the the fantasy is even more limiting because there's not like they can't just make up avenues of like some magical something happening that you can do stuff with. So oh, when, you're, when you've got a game where you're well, this isn't so much a, a building type game, was it? Like, no, like, no, no. Like, this is more of just like sandbox, like combat, you know, combat, killing combat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, then never mind. That completely destroys the point I was gonna make. <laughs> but uh, there general, are like war bands and such where you can like sort of create groups of, of roaming you know nations essentially or roaming groups of uh, individuals who go and fight against other ones in collective groups and there may be areas in the game where you guys can like hide out and 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 stay but I don't recall there being a large sort of like building portion of the game like a, a large sure, so like, it's more like more like a planet side two ish kind of thing like yeah like, I, I, I would surmise correct other, correct sort of correct. Yeah, that's the sort of thing I could see myself be a little more interested in. Like I said, you know, sort of in a Planet Side 2 kind of mode. A lot of it depends in a game like that on how the progression works and what kind of experience you get. And, you know, if I'm going to be you know, someone who plays the game, you know, if I, if I just start out, you know, six months later or whatever, I'm just going to be completely owned by people who are, you know, if there's max level or who have the best swords or, what, or whatever. That's just, I don't want to bash my face into the ground or into a wall for, you know, six months because I have to get to that point. I want to at least be somewhat competitive early on. Yeah. For me, personally, I've always been a big fan of medieval stuff. I've always wanted to see, like, huge medieval fight- fights. And to my knowledge, they still have, like, their implementation of crafting systems and whatnot. So you will be able to, like, craft, you know, your weapons and your armor. Um, and it all is dependent on what you wear and what, what weapons you use in terms of how your fighting style actually is. Because having heavier armor makes you slower. Lighter armor makes you quicker, obviously. Um, so I, I kind of like that sort of real life, you know, like this is, you know, if you if, if it seems like it's heavy, it means you're going to be moving slower, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's a little bit more about the visual aspect of it, you know, how you can read your opponent based on what they wear, not so much what class they are. And that, that's appealing to me. I, I'm still going to be, you know, a little bit speculative, but I personally am looking forward to Gloria Victus, and I, I hope that... You know, it's it's using Unity, which we're seeing a lot of games, especially MMOs now, it seems like. We have another one talk, coming up that we're going to talk about that uses Unity as well. Uh, and uh, I, I want to remain a little bit uh, hopeful for Gloria Victus. I, I think that uh, the team certainly seems to be gaining steam, and we'll see where they can take it from here. So we got Kevin, who's like, nah. And then Jason, you, you're a little bit wishy-washy, and I, I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the optimist. I'm the optimist. I'm over here, like, scratching my beard, like, hmm, it could happen, it can work. So that's that's our sort of introductory. This, If this was a meal, this would be, like, our appetizer, if you will. Just a touch of sandbox news to start off with. Moving along, we have Life is Feudal, which actually was suggested to be a topic of discussion uh, by some of the fans on the comment page on YouTube. So thanks for that. I actually took a look at Life is Feudal. And Jason, Kevin... I gotta say, the game looks really interesting. It's not quite free-to-play. It has some free-to-play elements in it, which I love to talk about and get your opinions on. Um, but there are quite a number of sort of intriguing systems in play with Life is Feudal. It's developed by a Russian-based studio called Bitbox. 
Um, and it also was sort of like Gloria Victus in that it had a failed Indiegogo campaign, uh, but it's since sort of been finding a little bit of uh, alternative funding in other places. Um, began development in October 2010, and it features interesting systems like a full loot and death penalties, so people can loot your body uh, when you die, and when you die, you actually lose some of the skill points uh, that dictate whether or not you're good at a particular weapon or what have you. There's a persistent world with no loading screens, free build with private property and land claim system, unlimited terraforming, which we'll talk about in a little bit, even combat formations, which is really kind of cool, where basically it'll create a giant square or a rectangle or a triangle, and then your party can form up in that triangle to form a cohesive uh, formation in battle. I think that's a really great addition that I, don't, I can't believe people haven't thought about before when they deal with siege-based combat. So, Kevin, Jason, uh, have you guys actually had a chance to check out Life is Feudal yet? It, uh, it's also in Unity. This is one of the other MMOs in Unity yeah, currently. I did look at it, and this one does interest me. Like, is just Especially the whole idea of the loot and death penalties and just like losing skill points and stuff and how just detailed they are on like every little thing. Um, the big one that I noticed is the whole cooking thing. Like when you like eating food and stuff can help you actually bonus like level your other skills. So like everything is important. It's not just like oh you can do just this and be fine. They really focus on kind of making you sure you're good at so many different things across everything. And it's very detailed, very intricate. And it's I guess like that's why I feel like it's something new. There's there's some real things that like sucking at the game. You'll just get beat up a bunch and die. Yeah, I mean, it does seem to be like they're trying to promise a lot. Uh, from the early, I believe it was alpha or pre-alpha gameplay footage that they showed, the game obviously looked like it was in a pretty early state, graphically speaking. Um, but their their system seemed to be, at least in their rudimentary form, available for you to actually see and see how they work. Uh, one of the interesting ones was the, the mini-game uh, for the whole crafting. You know, you mentioned the... Uh, the food system for hunger, basically, whereby, uh, just so everybody knows, the game Life is Feudal, Feudal doesn't actually feature levels. Uh, I think that's a big thing we should talk about at the beginning, is everything is skill-based. So you mine, or you go and you fight with a one-hand axe or something like that, and you get your skills, and the skills keep leveling up to a skill cap of, I believe, 100 per skill. And the developers mentioned on the site that like the first 90 skills or so are like fairly easy to get. You can get those in like a couple of weeks if you like really work at it for a particular uh, type of action. But then those last 10 skills are really where like it, it comes into a little bit of a grind to get those perfected. You know the best skills of that particular type where you can master it. And it, it kind of makes me a little bit scared because I'm like, wow, death penalties. You lose these skill points, and these skill points apparently take some time. And I understand that they want to make it a hardcore MMO in that respect, but th that seems to be a little bit. Uh, I, I mean, I play Eve. Don't get me wrong, but in Eve Online, there are systems in place where you don't lose your skill points if you die. Uh, you just have to keep on track of it, you know, by uh, like a cloning system. This not so much. It's this is pretty cut and dry. You're you're gonna get like screwed over when you when you die. And I don't know how I feel about that. Jason, what about you? Yeah, I know that I don't like it. <laughs> you don't like it? But, uh, you know, there are a couple things. One being, as you said, if it's fairly easy to get those skill points back, that mitigates it a little bit. But in general, it just feels like it's punitive as opposed to being something that the other person wants to do because they... they I can understand killing a guy because you want his stuff. You have full corpse looting or whatever. If that's part of it, I understand. You kill the guy, you get his stuff. Also, impeding his progress in terms of his character, that doesn't get you anything. That just is an it's like a like, dick move. Kicking the guy while he's down. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. what it is. So, I mean, I, I, I get some of that. And the, the issue is, and we're going to go on about this, but one of the things I, I dislike about Sandbox is the feeling that you have to be all in or, or not at all. Like, you have to be that kind of guy who plays for weeks and weeks and hour, 10 hours a day or whatever if you're going to get anywhere. And that's sort of where that sort of feeling comes from. It's like, all right, so if that happens to you and you lose your skill points, now you got to just play more to get those skill points back up. You know, you, you have to be the kind of guy who's going to play all the time so that you can have higher skill points so that you can be the one who's doing the killing and not the one being killed. Now, and, go know, ahead, go ahead. Now that, 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 I mean, that's, that's about the point of it. I, 
I, I don't like I don't mind having penalties for death, but I think if it's something that doesn't benefit the killer, as in you know getting your stuff, then it's just the game you know screwing with you. I, yeah. I do agree. I feel like there's going to have to be some limits to how badly someone can do. Like maybe there's just a way that someone who's really really high skill level can't run up against someone who's really really low skill level just just because it would just keep bashing them so, back into zero-ness? <laughs> there is a reputation system of sorts. Uh, I did read about it a little bit on the, the fact sheet about it, and it, specifically, um, it is very hard to gain reputation. You gain reputation by doing tasks and what have you, not killing other players, um, but you lose reputation when you kill another player. You lose it pretty rapidly, they said. Okay, but um, what's the point of it? What is the disadvantage of having a The disadvantage, well, this is the thing. So... Uh, that reputation, I believe, is used for like going into certain areas or accessing certain gear or certain advantages or perks, if you will. Uh, without that reputation, you would not be able to do that. Okay. It, it's if, there's a, if there are in-game restrictions to it, then okay, then yeah. I can see that. If it wasn't just like a little, like your Xbox, what is it, the feedback score or whatever? Oh yeah, yeah. It's just a thing there that doesn't really do anything. Then I'd be like, screw that. Yeah. There, there's a separate thing to it too, uh, whereby. Uh, a player who is getting ganked, who is getting killed, and who knows he will die uh, if he doesn't do something, he can yield to the enemy player. And if he yields to the enemy player, he takes extra damage. Not the player he's yielding to, but the yielding player himself. He takes extra damage, but um, the enemy player, if the enemy player ends up killing him while in the yield state, the enemy player will lose like a way, way more reputation than normally. Like an incredible more amount of reputation. And um, that if he doesn't actually kill a person, I believe he still gets uh, his loot. Like he still like loses his loot somehow, but he doesn't lose his skill points, essentially. Yeah, because I know some people are going to be like, oh, it's a sandbox, open world, you should be able to do anything you want to anybody. It's supposed to be realistic that way. And I'm thinking, you know... Realistically, people don't go out murdering each other. Left yeah, and right there's, the consequences. there's consequences. There's yeah, exactly. So, yeah, there, there, there's. If you want to be realistic, quote unquote, there should be some system in place that gives you a, gives you an incentive not to just murder everybody. Now, going back to the the crafting system really quickly here, and like all that, uh, Kevin, you touched on the 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 uh, hunger system, the basically cooking. Uh, that this sort of brings back the whole skill thing. Basically, with cooking. When you cook and you make really, really nice food using really nice ingredients, um, that multiplies your skill gain so that it's actually relevant to be a cook. Everybody will want the best kind of food because the best kind of food is what will result in you leveling the quickest. So it's kind of interesting how they you know, incorporated the cooking element to that. And in, in particular, it will make cooks relevant because of the fact that everybody will be dying and losing their skill levels. So the cook will be necessary so you can like, get your skill levels back up where you want them to. I'm going to become a professional in-game chef. Seriously, that's all I'm going to do. It just brings me back to SOTOR times, you know, when literally you could be a dancer in a cantina, and by dancing in the cantina, uh, or cantina, uh, the uh, I believe it gave you some kind of boost to your stamina. You know, you had to, like, go and rest in a cantina for a certain amount of time. And so SOTOR, it, I assume you meant Star Wars Galaxy. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh God! Don't don't tell the don't tell the Galaxy fans that you were thinking about Sword. Oh, I'm sorry, Galaxy fans. Please don't be angry. You know you know I meant well. You know that's what I was trying to talk about. Acronyms sometimes, you know. Come on. But but just to bring up the crafting system too. If you watch, they had a video on their site about crafting, and it showed uh, like the, you can do it a couple ways. You can do like these sort of automatic crafting, which is like you usually do in a lot of MMOs. You know, this this and this, push a button, and it, and it crafts the thing. But they also have like a skill game that you can choose to do. And they say that that actually gets you stuff quicker. I'm not sure how that works because it seems to actually take longer. But they say that it is an advantage to doing it that way. But you don't have to. You can do it the, the kind of easy way. And you can also, like, it's like you can have a friend make stuff for you. Yeah, I was looking at... All sorts of different options. I love that someone is trying something a little different with crafting as opposed to, like I said, usually it's just that put the three ingredients together and you make a thing. Yeah, they, 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 they basically give you the linear version that everybody's used to. You put the things in, like you were saying. You hit the craft and it crafts it. But the mini game, that's the second thing. It was like a mini game of sorts where like if you're chopping down a tree, you actually had to like angle the axe so that you hit the tree in different angles or what have you. And you were mentioning that it, it yielded more. I think it actually just gives you more resources if you're crafting it or if you're like I thought you know, they said it went faster. Down. Like it was somehow quicker or more it, efficient or something like that. I think it's quicker or more efficient... 
Yeah, yeah. I think because it said like the longer you craft it normally, the longer it takes. Like the yeah. more you craft it. But if you do the mini game, it's shorter and you may yield more. Is what I, I think that's how I was understanding it to actually say. Um, but the mini games, you know, they they look pretty basic at times. But it did it did break up the monotony. You know, not having to just wait for a hundred things to craft over and over, and then having your bags filled with a hundred like one particular item and what have you. Um, one thing I kind of wanted to touch on because this seems to be a really popular thing that everybody's adding in their games is terraforming. The whole I, I I'm not calling this voxel. I don't think this is voxel. We actually have more voxel stuff later on in the show, um, but it does look like you can you know scoop out areas of the ground, more predefined areas. It looks like boxy. Uh, but then there's like oh, you know raising areas of the ground, lowering areas of the ground, terraforming it how you wish to build moats and castles under the ground and what have you. Just basically everything under the ground that you can think of is sort of the the, the gist of the video that I got because he was building all these tunnels all over the place. What do you guys actually think about that? Like, do you think that terraforming has a sort of place in a game like this where everybody's like on the edge of dying all the time and you know there seems to be like a lot of opportunity for grief in a game like this yeah i think this is just waiting to be griefed um if, if there's no way that like to keep people from getting to your stuff you're just gonna have a giant hole and i yeah it, it's just messy i i don't see any way that they can not grief this without really just putting some strict limitations but they said it's unlimited so I don't see this heading down a good place. There is some sort of like property claim system that's going to be put in place where you can claim an area and then you can build on that area and what have you. There's also, they said free build. I don't know if that free build means you can build wherever you want, uh, but there is at least some sort of private property thing where you can you know claim an area. So I don't know if that means that you know players won't be able to mess with it or if it's just your area and no one else can build there, but everybody else can you know screw with it because, hey... This is a full loot and death penalty game. F*** you, you know that kind of thing. Like, I, I have to put a bleeper there. Boop. Um, but yeah, that's how I feel sometimes with this. I don't know. I, I on the one hand, I think they have a really cool idea with a lot of cool systems. A lot of it does seem a little bit pie in the sky, um, given the fact that it is very early on in development. If you can tell by the video, and a lot of this stuff is going to take a lot of time to do. So, plus when you're using an engine like Unity, although it is very flexible. Um, it's always easier to make, you know, really full-fledged MMOs like this in your own engine, or at least an engine designed to handle, like, larger projects, if you will. So there's a little bit of, like, wishy-washy, not sure how this is going to turn out, but it is, if they can pull it off, it is very promising. Although we know Kevin, or sorry, Jason, you won't, you're not going to actually be playing it. You're going to, or if you are going to be playing it, you're going to be like a hermit in the cave. No one knows where he is because he don't want to die. I'm not going to play it too much for when I, when I see what the free-to-play restrictions are like. That's the thing. That's another thing that we have to talk about. The free-to-play restrictions are quite heavy. You guys wanted to talk about this, but you, I don't know if you're prepared to hear about what happens to free-to-play players. So, there is a free-to-play element to it. And Jason, you seem like... You're 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 itching to to mention what exactly is wrong with the free to play, but go ahead. I think you summed it up pretty well. We say it's basically just a trial because it's whatever with a skill cap at 150, and what full wipes of everything every day. Yeah. So it as a newbie, as a free to play player, it's essentially a trial. You go in, you can be in the newbie island where you sort of get acclimated to the game. All of your skills are capped at 150. So what that means is each skill is capped at 100. Which in total means you can have one skill capped at 100 and another skill capped at 50 and then that's your two skills. Maybe you can have three skills capped at 50 each, but your overall skill cap is 150. And if you build anything in the newbie area, the next day it's wiped. So the newbie area stays in a persistent sort of look every day and everything that you do there just gets deleted the next day. So you don't really get a, a lot of like persistent options. And that's really disheartening because even if we go by the next most uh i guess you say restrictive sandbox mmo that i could find would be mortal online so mortal online is fairly restrictive it's what free to play last year but re uh, restricted the free to play users to max skill levels or to a, a amount of max skill levels rather uh, character slots and they were also locked out from using thievery skills owning houses looting expensive objects and trading those expensive objects so they were restricted by far but it still was allowing them to like play around a little bit in the main world 
this is pretty much just a trial. And so I kind of take offense to the fact that they say it's a it's a combination of free to play and buy to play. Because it's more just like free to play, and then if you like it, you purchase some coins, which allow you to then play the rest of the game. Which yeah, is buy to play. It's a pretty as hard of a paywall as you can have, just about. It, it, it's it's harder than Sotor's paywall. Yes, yes. That's that's saying a lot. Like if it's harder than Sotor's <laughs> paywall, then then you know, like that's that's the litmus test. You know, that's the extreme side of a, of the spectrum, if you would. So yeah, guys, you wanted us to find out a little bit more to talk about it. There's the whole synopsis of Life is Feudal. It's a great looking game in the sense that they have a lot of cool systems going into it, and they really seem to have thought out a fair amount of them. Uh, but unfortunately right now they're, they're seeming to just go the, the buy-to-play route uh, with just a really, really limited free-to-play option. Hey, if you guys talk to them on their forums, if you reach out to them, who knows? Maybe they'll change their stuff. But if you want to learn more information about them, I'll go ahead and include a link to their official site in the description box below in case you want to go check it out yourselves. But all right, moving on, we've got even more sandbox news. And this time, it's in regards to a new title from Tryon. Tryon always just seems to be like, like they're always that kid in the back of the class that like, does anyone else have anything to say? And they're like, oh, me, me, me. I have something else I want to show you. It also happens to be very similar to other things. You know, RTS, MMO, in this case, uh, Voxel. Yeah, Trove. Trove. Get it? Treasure Trove? Tryon releases uh, or announces uh, Trove? Uh, Trove. Trove. So, Jason, you know a little bit about Trove. What exactly yeah. is Trove? Uh, Trove is, as you said, it's a voxel-based uh, game. They, the comparison of people are saying it's a little little cube world, a little uh, Minecraft, not uh, not exactly... Uh, one of both i'm just trying to find the they, uh... they did say in there's a reddit post that sort of surmises all of the developer quotes and right. they did say they did agree that it was actually it fell within the genre spectrum uh, yeah. of of cube world they actually admitted to that cube here's, world here's and a, minecraft the, the phrase is going to say an open world an open-ended voxel adventure through countless realms filled with quests chests and enemies great and small it's got like a procedurally generated world you're gonna be able to build stuff. They're gonna have very, you know, a pretty decent amount of like PVE style combat with enemies and monsters and all that stuff. So it's not just, not just building. Um, but yeah, it's interesting and it's like very, very soon apparently. Yeah, they said that uh, there's gonna be invites into the uh, beta uh, or alpha. I forget which phase they're in right now. That they're gonna be invites within the next coming weeks, not months. Yes, weeks. An interesting thing about the system that I wanted to talk about was the fact that you build basically a home base, if you will. You can add stuff to it. You can add structures and stuff to this area. And these structures can show up in other people's worlds. So this isn't just one world. Don't like a normal MMO where you, your every, world is populated, everybody sees the same world, etc. It seems like in this game, everybody kind of has an, their own adventure. And then when they're done with that adventure in one world, it moves on to a new world. And that world is happens to be populated by things that were made by other players along with things that the developers sort of you know randomly generated as well so you get a mismatch or a mix match of things that were randomly generated things that developers added and things that the players created using all of their you know tools and whatever of exploring uh, this voxel based area aesthetically you mentioned it, it did very much look like cube world uh, but I really find that whole system of like randomizing or changing out the area you're exploring every so often uh, it, very intriguing. It, it definitely sort of adds a new edge to the whole sandbox MMO experience because you're literally, you know, stepping on new ground every few days or something like that. You know, they... it, it does. But on the other hand, it's like I want I want some coherency to my world, to my game world. I want there to be. I want it to feel like it's, you know, the the valley between the two mountains or the the vast desert with sand sculptures all over the place. You know, being being an actual place rather than just seem like a more or less random collection of stuff. You know, it's like I'd I'd rather be in in Azeroth, which has you know various places that you kind of recognize, as opposed to here's another sixteen biomes that are just all around. That 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 thing is kind of maybe a little iffy regarding some of these games. I have a feeling I would just get lost constantly because if stuff's always constantly like changing, if you, especially if you don't get to play every single day, and maybe it's based on time or whatever, I'm just... It's based on... This is how it's based on. So there's, again, a little bit more clarification from that Reddit post. Um, according to the developers, what happens is 
you have objectives. It is still goal based. It is still like you have to do something. And that thing uh, is the broad idea is you'll be collecting 10 pendants of power to awaken the great one. And then once defeated, everyone on the map gets a reward and a new world will be generated up. Uh, there's still details to be you know drawn up, etc. But that's the general thing. So there's still objectives. There's still loot for you to gain from it. Uh, you can customize your character. There's still levels, etc. Uh, but your whole experience revolves around these different missions or these different quests that you'll experience in each new world. And hopefully, each new world will have different quests or just different objectives. That way you're not just collecting these 10 pennants at the same time every time. And I do love the notion of, of a ran of random world every you know every time you log in or every however often it takes to switch around because I like the notion that it's not just going to be this that same familiar place that you've been to all the time. Again, I, it's not, that sounds contradictory to what I just said, but I mean, I want it to I would like it to feel like if you could if you could like randomly generate a World of Warcraft world or something like that every you know couple of months or whatever. That's the sort of thing I would like, but I'd still like it to look like a quote unquote real world. They're sort of going the the EverQuest route a little bit, where they say that your creations can appear in your world and others. So there's, you said you wanted a little bit of uh, persistence, and I guess they're trying to go that route. I, with, oh, I guess that could that could count as it. With yeah. like having your home base area be the same, or whatever you built, you know, that what travels with you from world to world, um, and you can invite other people, you know, to check it out and what have you. And there's there's classes and different abilities while you, that you can swap out. So you can always sort of have like a refreshing new adventure, but it does certainly seem to to be where everything past your cornerstone, your your sort of like home base, is new, you know, at a fairly often pace. And I kind of like the the idea of like you. It almost feels like uh, like Mario worlds or like a, a Zelda zone, where once you defeat the major boss of that zone, you move on to the next zone, and that zone again is flavored around whatever monster. Uh, that you happen to be facing. And if you watch the trailer, the teaser trailer, you can see that these monsters are fairly large. You know, they're they're different size, different shapes, and it even mentions in the in the sort of synopsis that uh, they want players to create things other than buildings. Like they mentioned creating monsters and what have you. And those monsters appearing in the worlds of other players. So all of that is very sort of EverQuest landmarky. It, it feels just a tad another, bit. Another example too, if you. Remember a few months ago, we heard a little bit about a, a Civilization online game they were working on in Korea, which was going to be that same kind of thing. So you now a game of Civilization is you start with nothing and you build up your Civ and then eventually you win and you play another game on a new mm -hmm. map. They were going to do that with the Civ online game and you'd carry over some skills or, or whatever onto the next game, but it would restart every time. So that's kind of that's kind of what I could sort of think of that you know, Civ, a Civilization map is a random procedurally generated world and it's different every time. One thing that I could definitely see being a problem is like if you're a casual player, if you're someone who doesn't play very often, um, you can say like be really enjoying one world, uh, log off for a couple days because you have to go do something. You come back, it's a completely different world. You've lost the ability to you know finish that adventure, if you will. I am sort of c concerned about that because it does mention that the world changes for everybody in there when those goals or objectives are met, you know, getting those 10 stones or whatever. So is that based on who you invite into your world? Like, there's a lot of questions in that. And, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how many players actually, if this is an MMO, you know, it's persistent, how many players are actually in one particular zone and how many players can influence the experience of other players in terms of what changes and when. Because if it is based on what events players actually participate in, you know, someone could be offline for a week and two or three zones could have gone by and they don't even know, you know, they don't, it seems like they would be lacking or, or missing out on adventures uh, that they would most likely love to participate in. But since it's not persistent in the normal sense, uh, they, they don't get a chance to do so. What do you I think, think Kevin? the only way you can keep um, them happy is you either have to really limit the number of people in each zone uh, set an actual time limit for how long it takes to acquire each like thing or make them incredibly difficult to get because if you've got like four million people in the same zone and there's only ten stones, ten stones of power or whatever it is you're gonna have them going through with just seconds apart like zone 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 so wow when did when did trove suddenly become like like near World of Warcraft numbers <laughs> four million people in one zone like, four million <laughs> people I'm like oh man ahead of time. Like Let's hope it's not four million. <laughs> could just make this go so fast. There's gonna have to be some serious limits on. You mean MMO players are gonna? You mean MMO players are gonna quickly blast through content? Come on, man. 
That never lot. happens. Ever. Especially if there's like a reward system, which is, it looks like this is more, it's a reward system, but driven through adventure. You're rewarded by adventuring and sort of completing these objectives by adventuring, which I think is actually pretty cool. But we'll have to see exactly how big these worlds are. One thing that makes Cube World or Minecraft popular is that it's procedurally generated and infinite. You can just, you know, go in one area and almost infinitely, and you know, find new things and new areas. You know, how big are these zones, especially if they are objective-based? Are, are these objectives, like, really far away, or how close are they to, like, the main area, and how easy will it, to be, will it be to actually go out and complete them or even find them? Those are all the questions that we have left uh, with games like this. It seems like Trove has just opened up a bigger treasure trove of questions at... Uh, than of uh, treasures uh, itself. Uh, yeah, okay. There we go. Ha, uh, ha. Yeah, let's just... What's that? What is let's, that? Let's move, let's Bad joke eel? That. Bad joke eel, I think, is the meme. Eh, gotta put the meme right there. Okay. All righty. So that is our trove information. If you guys want to learn more, go ahead and check out the article on MMOBomb.com. Now, moving on to our last bit of sandboxing news. Now, this kind of actually seems like... At this point, EverQuest Next Landmark, spoiler alert, that's what we're talking about now. It kind of seems like uh, it's only been announced for a couple of months, but it's it's sort of the veteran now when it comes to sandbox MMOs. It's like, yeah, we've we've talked about it a number of times on the, the podcast. Are we still now. talking about this game? I mean, really? I know, right? <laughs> Isn't this game old news now? Like, it's not even out yet, but it's already old news. Uh, next landmark, again, some further details coming out. Uh, but notably, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the pre-purchase packs, which were just announced last week. Those packs, of course, are allow you to gain immediate access to the alpha once it goes live, which happens on February 28th, I believe. Uh, and then also, if you purchase the lesser packs, you'll gain access to the beta, uh, which goes live in March. Uh, I believe. So you do get access fairly, fairly, yeah, March 28th is when the closed beta starts. Um, you do get access fairly early on by purchasing these packs, which is something that we've seen standard from a lot of packs before. Uh, but the price is $100 for Trailblazer, $60 for Explorer, and $20 for Settler Pack. Quite exuberant. And some of the rewards could arguably be a little bit uh, of a, I don't know, what would you call something that would miff people? A miffer. I don't want to say pay to you know what. No. Pay to slight advantage. See, that that is the thing. Uh, we're talking specifically about an item to start with. We're talking about an item, a pickaxe. You know, how can a pickaxe be paid to win? Like, tell me, Jason. I don't know. How does a pickaxe be paid to win? If but... every time, you, if every time you, you use it, unicorns come out of the rock. Yeah, and you're like, oh, this unicorn's worth a thousand gold. That's I, I, could, I make my entire house out of unicorns. <laughs> It's the most rare unicorn blood. The most rare resource. Well, yeah, that, that, yeah, that, that's well, and then, of course, the first person to make the shiny unicorn is then, of course, the best. So The shiny unicorn? Oh, you do making a Pokemon reference there? I was. I you was. You were. I heard. I saw. I conquered. All right. No. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they have a pickaxe that comes with all these packs. And this pickaxe uh, it's a pretty good pickaxe. Like, for those of you who don't know, there are four different types of tools that you'll be able to use in the game they've announced two of them one being the axe and the other one being the pick pick. yes pick so together this is a pickaxe so it's the two actual things in one and apparently uh, according to this live stream that recently came out uh, I believe on Thursday uh, the SOE developers they talked about how this pickaxe actually works so apparently there are tiers of pickaxes and tiers of axes and picks and what have you. And this is a top tier one axe, no pick, and a top tier or a beginning tier five axe. And what that means is as a top tier one pick, it can harvest all of the tier one resources like stone, um, soft material like amber, that kind of stuff. But it can't go up to the harder materials. You know, it wouldn't be able to go up to things like diamond or maybe steel or whatever you would make steel out of or iron, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, on the flip side of that, the axe portion of the pickaxe is a tier five, but the lower side of tier five. So that means that it can harvest every sort of wood in the entire kingdom of EverQuest Next Landmark. Uh, but it does it at a very, very slow pace. It's the slowest of the tier fives. 
So you have sort of extremes there. So it's not the best overall. It's it's the best of the tier one and the worst of the tier five. What do you guys think? Is that a, a nice balance? Do you feel like? Do you even feel like this is something that could actually be construed as pay to win? I mean, you're just collecting resources. This isn't like you're hitting people over the head with a pickaxe. Like Jason said, if it doesn't, you know, poop out unicorns and rainbows when you hit a rock with it, there's no way it's like pay to win. <laughs> Yeah, but realistically, though, I guess as long as you can get better stuff actually in game, I suppose it's all right. Even though it's just it's a pay to early advantage, pay to early win, maybe is what it is. Not pay to always be the best ever. Would you argue that this is just a tangible, permanent boost to your resource gain up until a certain point, up until you get a better? Yeah, pickaxe? yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, until you get until you can craft the better stuff, then yeah, it, it's probably a significant advantage probably lets you get to that better stuff a lot quicker and you're going to be harvesting that stuff more quickly now maybe you're lucky and my my good friend kevin will get that package and he'll gather stuff for me so maybe it won't be so bad maybe we can work together that is one thing i am very sort of excited about during the the live stream would you watch the full live stream video on immobomb.com uh but during the live stream they mentioned that they had a recent event where uh people just collaboratively started working together on something because it was just easier for them to actually create stuff you know they just make it easier for them to make these fanciful buildings while one's working on the outside the other person's working on the inside you know they they can just you know put it together so i i doubt there's going to be so much competition with oh man he's collecting all these resources so much faster than me you know you're probably going to be right next to him collecting too you know you just go out for a day of pickaxe mining down in the wells you know i ho i ho Jason, I, I feel like because this, we are now going to create a unicorn castle. Um, to you're going to create, you can go right ahead and create a unicorn castle. You know what we'll do? With all the sandbox games come out, we'll definitely host it at a, a event day where everybody in the MMO Bomb community, we can all go out together in EverQuest Next Landmark and we'll create something. We'll create the bomb, maybe, from MMO Bomb. How about that? We'll go and mine it all. We'll put it up. And then we'll, just... and, and then we'll murder each other with our pickaxes. And then we'll murder <laughs> each other with our pickaxes. That would be awesome. Um, there are a couple of the like actual items that these packs get, which I wanted to talk about. There is uh, the addition of a ring of bounty, which randomly increases the amount of resources you collect. Again, it just is boosting the amount of resources you collect. Um, and then there's also a void bank where basically you can access your bank from anywhere, uh, which even other players can get, but they have to craft it, and it takes about a couple of weeks to gather the necessary resources. So again, these are all things that are accessible by other players, and I like the fact these these are accessible by crafting. It's not like, <coughs> say, Planet Side Two, where you're like, yeah, that gun is accessible, you know, for free as well, but I have to get all these certs in order to craft this gun. Kind of well, thing. but don't you think it's going to be the same thing to get the to craft your void vault that it's not going to require something on the level of getting a thousand certs? Or it something? could, it so could, it could definitely be that. But I, I, I would have, I would have to think that. Um, as a whole, the the whole advantage of getting more resources early uh, from like the Ring of Bounty and stuff like that, that would be something that is negligible. So only in reality are the Void Bank is like the only thing that like people can actually see like a huge difference in of like oh okay this actually takes some time. But I I don't think like anything else as far as like going out and mining stuff and, and, and picking stuff up to, to craft with or to, to make buildings out of, I don't think that in that area itself is going to be like really noticeable between someone who paid and got like a couple of different items to give them boosts and someone who, you know, just goes out and, and, and does it themselves because it, it, again, it always goes back to the whole collaborative thing. Um, I do like the fact though, that the trailblazer adds extra beta keys. You get four extra beta keys for getting the $99 trailblazer, which Again, I don't like paying for beta or alpha at all. Trailblazer gets alpha, but he gets four beta keys for his friends. Um, but it is nice to see that you do at least, you know, you can bring in other friends to help you build because that's the point of playing EverQuest Next Landmark. You, you want to build things with other people. You want to do things as a group. You know, that's why people play Minecraft and Minecraft servers together. But... Speaking of beta, I did want to talk to you guys about what they're doing for people who aren't purchasing these packs. So, during the stream, which was about 50 minutes long, the first 24 minutes of it, we're basically talking about the packs and clarifying the pack stuff and just 
saying how awesome these packs are and how people should totally upgrade if they want to upgrade and how people are already upgrading because it's so awesome of a pack. You know, there's a lot of pushing of that. Um, but delving into the information regarding people who aren't paying for packs and wanting to get beta access, you only get seven days of timed trial beta access if you happen to get a key. Seven days? I, I, the only thing I can think of, the only reason I can think of this is, you know, some games will have a continuous beta, which is, you know, like Firefall has been like that. You know, it has a beta that goes on for months and months. I think World of Warcraft does that too with their betas. And some games have beta weekends or beta events that last a couple of days. And this kind of makes it feel a little more like that. If you don't pay for it, you're getting the equivalent of a, you're getting a beta week instead of like a beta weekend. So that I guess I kind of get, but it does really seem like a way that they're really trying to push you to buy one of the, one of the packs. Yeah. I mean, it really clearly does look like that because of the fact that Seven days, if you, if you think about it, you're trying to build something in seven days, you're trying to explore, you know, you can't really explore everything and really try, and it is a beta, you know, obviously in betas you're trying to look for bugs and stuff, and in a time trial beta, it's clear that they think these people who are going to get in are people who just want to look around for seven days, mm -hmm. right? They, they're clearly limiting their ability to be a beta tester. Um, whereby, and they're, they're putting everybody else, those people who purchase these packs on a little bit of a pedestal. And I guess it's, it's justifiable. They did spend money. They did clearly say that they're invested in the game, but I don't think that it means that they should limit outside opinion of the game. I think that, you know, outside players should just have a chance to play the game just as much if they are lucky enough to get a beta, because in my opinion, their, their whole thing about this is that they're trying to get more people in quicker. You know, more beta keys sent out because it's seven days. They know however many people are actually going to be playing during those seven days at the maximum, etc. But, I don't know. In this day and age, with a game so popular as EverQuest Next Landmark, if you win a beta key, that's a pretty exciting thing. And to have it marred by just seven days? Ah. Kevin, what do you think? Uh, I'm curious to know if the extra beta keys that come with the big packs are the time trial ones or full versions. You I know? believe they're full. I believe okay, they're well, full. I think that will go a long way. I think what we might see, and I, this may sound silly, is maybe people just going in together and like everyone pitching in like 10 bucks or whatever and then like just spreading the keys out so you all get the full access. Mm -hmm. yeah, because that will get a lot of people in there without really having to spend a ton getting access to, I guess, some of the important stuff of it. And especially if you can play with your friends and stuff, you can give them the resource that your super pickaxe got you already. So, Yeah, it, it does seem like it, they're really making it easy for people to just share resources. And so maybe that's like some... I don't want to say they're smart enough to kind of make some clever way to like, hey, let's get groups of people to play this game together, but that might be just part of it. So who knows? Hey, if you have groups of people playing your game together, then all of a sudden your population grows because yeah. you're not having one person play by themselves. You're having one person play with four friends. And, and that's what these packs are doing, and that's, again, going to make sure that people will do it to make sure they get a chance to play. So Very right. Now, we talked a little bit about the packs, but there was, there was some gameplay footage in there, some early gameplay footage of Landmark. I mean, it was very rudimentary. It was just a character flying around, but she was building something. It, it, it did seem like it was very easy and intuitive to build. A lot of, like, ability to contour stuff and, you know, turn the edges smooth and make the points easy to, you know, make things concave and beveled and what have you. Kevin, you actually took a pretty good look at that and stuff. What did you think of it? What did you think of, like, the ease of doing that? It was way easier looking than I thought it was going to be. Um, especially, like, when he described just how the erasers and everything and the smoothing the contour tools and how everything really worked, just the adjustment of the sizes and just flipping it. It's way more intuitive than, than you feel like it should be. Um, I, it's, I almost thought, like, I was, they were kind of trying to trick you because it seems like, you know, when you see the detail of these buildings that come out afterwards, you're like, that doesn't seem doable with the just basic tools. It just, it's going to take time to master it as well as just practice. But I was greatly impressed with, one, the level of detail you could do without too much effort, and two, just how easy and intuitive the tools seemed to be. 
Jason, do you, looking at what EverQuest Next Landmark is trying to do, do you feel that Landmark is a evolution of something like Terraria, Minecraft, Cube World, or I, I guess not even Cube World because you don't really build too much in Cube World, but games like Minecraft and like Terraria, do you feel like it is a evolution in that step, or do you feel like it's something completely different that you can't really compare the two? I think uh, I've talked about this with some other people, and it feels like Landmark is like the building the building aspect of this universe, whereas the real EverQuest Next is going to be more like the combat version. It's going to be a little more MMO-like, whereas this Landmark is going to be more of the building game. And in that sense, yes, I would say it is an evolution of the building games with a little bit more emphasis on the role-playing, the RPG, and the combat aspect, which I think they said earlier, I think that's kind of lacking in a lot of the other games, that they devote themselves too much to, to the building and the, the combat tends to lack or be very simplistic as a result. It is very true. And maybe that's, and maybe that's what it's going to take. I mean, if there was one of the uh, comments on the Reddit was a guy who was saying, you know, I'm not really into... I, actually, I think that kind of stuff is kind of neat, but I'm more into like the RPG action combat kind of thing. You know, what, or excuse me, that was actually someone talking about Trove. That, that was the, the Reddit for Trove. He said that same sort of thing. And they tried to say, you know, yeah, it is mostly a building game, but there's combat too, so... You might like that aspect of it too, and I think that's that's what those kind of games need a little bit more of to draw in that somewhat hesitant uh, crowd like myself, who's interested kind of in the building, but doesn't want the game to be you know 99% building. It wants a little more RPG combat kind of feel to it. Yeah, to me, it's like um, it's the feeling of like, oh, I, I didn't just go and find this resource; like I fought for this resource. You know, mm -hmm. I. I went and I found an area that was like filled with these monsters, and then, I like, didn't just punch the tree; the tree punched back. Yeah, yeah, like it came after me. It was trying to eat me, yeah. you know. And now it's a, you know, a rug, a tree rug on my floor. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. It's just bark on my floor, just strips of bark. You just That's want a real sense slivers. of accomplishment. Exactly. Yeah, real sense of accomplishment. And so I'm really looking forward to EverQuest Next Landmark. They didn't say too much about combat and stuff like that. That's stuff that they'll talk about in the future. To start with, we know that it will be basically just the building portion of it, which this is a very big project. And I can understand that things, you know, are come in development stages. They said that internally on the, the, pod, the uh, live stream internally, they're not even letting the whole office yet play. Like they're just now, I think, getting giving everybody access. So... We'll have it not too soon, a couple, not too late, rather, a couple of months from now we'll be well, able not to. Not too soon either, really. Not too soon either. <laughs> three it's months a, or whatever, yeah. Three months, it's like, it's, it's not like, like, you know, quarter four of next year, but it's not, I, I'll, I'll have to shave a couple times between now and then, you know, there's, there's going to be some time in between. But all right, that wraps up a little bit of our uh, sandbox news for today. I hope you're able to get all of the sand out between your toes and other respective areas. But uh, let us know what sandbox MMO you're looking forward to the most and what exactly about that sandbox MMO entices you so much. What pulls it ahead of all the others? I'm curious to know, guys. There does seem to be quite a few on the horizon. Weekly Bombs. This is where we talk about whether we thought something was awesome or incredibly terrible. I'm going to go ahead and give a da bomb to Planet Side 2. Hey, look at that. Another sandbox MMO. Um, the optimization patch happened last week, and holy crap. That was a huge, huge improvement. I mean, I was able to play it at an okay you know, 40 to 50 frame rate during combat, sometimes dipping down to about 32, 34, and I was considered myself lucky. Um, but the new patch is making my frame rate go up to like a steady 60 frame rate, even in combat. And we have reports of people who before were only getting 15, 20, getting a stable 40 frame rate, 30 frame rate in combat, even in heavy areas. Um, so we're seeing big increases in FPSs. And Jason, have you actually gotten to try out these changes? I know you play Planet Side 2. I have not had the chance yet, uh, partially because, partially having time and also partially because I'm just scared. As old and crappy as my computer is, I'm worried that I'm going to go in and it's not going to be any different. It's not going to be. I don't know. I've I've heard some reports of pretty. If you say people, computers. if you say people are getting 15 to 20 are doing better now, then that might work out. That's about what I get in combat. So, uh, yeah, and they they were I, saying they were able to turn out their graphical settings too. Some of them were, like they were able to to get 40 or 50 frame rate from their 20 and have better graphical settings. All right, I'm going to have to try that out probably tomorrow. Yeah, just to try it out a bit. Yeah, I was certainly impressed with it. I went from going like 35 up to a steady 50, 55 in combat. So. 
That's very nice. And it looks the same. Like, yeah, I, it, I don't see any difference in graphical quality. Like, the combat and everything, it's it's smooth. And I did notice that there's, like, way more players on right now. It does seem like there's been, like, a resurgence of players. That's great, because I logged on the other night, and it was just empty. Like, all three plan- all three continents. Oh, yeah, yeah, there did seem to be, there was a pretty good battle going on when I played uh, right before our podcast. So, there you go. That's about as fresh as it can be. It's, like, brand new sushi, Planetside 2 news, you know? All right, Jason. What? I sushi is pretty fresh. It's like the best thing I can come up with in my mind. I was trying to make an analogy there. Jason, what's your a bomb to bomb? I've got a triple a bomb. Oh man, it's gonna blow up everything. Triple hey. a bomb to Hammerpoint Interactive, YouTube, and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, Hammerpoint Interactive, the company that makes the incredibly wonderful Survivor infest, Infestation Survivor stories, previously known as the War Z, which was crapped upon so you, I'm not making it so you don't have to bleep uh, mm-hmm. and rightfully so last year when it launched in an awful state and the developer t- just lied about it basically so but it, you know, it sort of redeemed itself a little bit had some fans when it rebranded itself so it was kind of chugging along and then I just was alerted to it today about a guy who made a video for it and it's a very tongue in cheek kind of critical video of it just a goofy thing put it on YouTube and if you remember the thing that happened with Total Biscuit a few weeks ago where he uh, criticized another game, the developer went to YouTube and got it taken down. He filed a copyright strike against Total Biscuit, who, mm-hmm. of course, being Total Biscuit, went ballistic and you know made another video about how it got taken down. And the developer was like, oh, we, that was uh, an accident. Sorry for the confusion, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, basically they got really crapped upon for it. So this other guy who says he has, like, a dozen subscribers to his channel, you know, so not, nowhere near Total Biscuit, but he got his video for Infestation also claimed as a copyright infringement. Of course, because of that, because of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, YouTube had to take it down. So, and he got a copyright strike against him. So, really, really crappy job by Hammerpoint there, suppressing a a guy who doesn't really even says he in comments he you know he says he even kind of likes the game. He just made this for fun. But, oh my gosh, don't say anything bad about our game or we're going to complain to YouTube and get it taken down. Yeah, it really does um, make me a little bit uh, discouraged about the future of, quote-unquote, you know, gaming journalism. Uh, because there's all these these sort of threats, you know, like, oh, if I say anything bad about this company in any manner, you know, they either blacklist me or they get my videos taken down or they do something just to be dicks. Has that ever happened to you with all the stuff you've done for here and the other sites you've worked on? Oh, uh, if it has, um, usually you just never hear back from them. Like, I, I <laughs> well, I you, mean, you would know if you got a copyright strike. Oh, well. yeah. In terms of copyrights, I thought you were talking about just pissing a developer yeah, off. Yeah, no, like, no. I'm just saying, has, has YouTube ever actually put the clamps on you? Uh, YouTube has never put the clamps on me per se. They have put clamps on us for like saying like. Oh, you you have some trailer gameplay, you know, in your video, blah blah blah. But it's never been like a strike. It's just been like a okay. you have this in your video. We're gonna like remove or you know limit the income that you'll make from that video, essentially. Uh, but um, in, but in terms of like outright, you know, taking a video out, no, I, we've never had anything like that. Thankfully, we've never had anything like that. And I think it's just because uh, it, it seems more like a business. You know, that it's a little bit. When you have someone like a personality or something like that, I think companies think it's a little easier for them to flex their muscle uh, to sure. remove someone. But when it's more of a company, then it becomes like a more legal issue, etc. So that could be a thing. But if the companies have blacklisted us because of what we've said on MMO Bomb or YouTube, uh, I wouldn't be surprised because we've, we've certainly railed on quite a number of games <laughs> Over the last few years, so that's a whole nother topic, though. And just to clarify too, the guy he goes by Game Over Man. That's the name of his series on on YouTube. So okay. if you want to look him up and support him or whatever, that's what well, we call. Well, hopefully, so. Game Over isn't for him. He's not, you know. <laughs> there's no Game Over in his future in terms of copyright strikes. But Kevin, what is your a bomb to bomb? I'm giving an a bomb to myself. Uh, last week, I kind of said how I hated No Shave November. Well, I let it get the best of me, and uh, I got rid of the beard. And Man card revoked. I, I have a goatee still, so there's still some hair, but like I just couldn't do the full beard. It was just making me too upset. I'm still chugging along. It's coming. Just wait till you see me, guys, on Wednesday. Just wait till you see. 
I, I've it's been very online. impressed with it lately. I don't know if I've told him enough times because it is it is quite good. It is. I, I'm impressed. This is my first time. This is my first time, and uh, I think I might just keep it. I honestly do. All right, so member bombs. Uh, I think Bob taking over YouTube channel comments last week uh, sort of pushed a lot of the member questions away. We have banned Bob from YouTube, so at least from MMO bombs. So you shouldn't see too much of that invading the space. So you'll be able to get back to getting the member bombs sent up to us. But I was also thinking about having uh, one or two of you guys on at a time to sort of discuss your own member bombs and question the question of the week responses. I'm going to uh, leave this out here a couple weeks and see what kind of uh, feedback I get from you guys. And if it's something that interests you, who knows? Maybe we'll get you guys on the show and you could just tell us in person. Or I guess as close to in person as you can get uh, your answers. So moving on to the question of the week then. Question of the week last week was, do you enjoy playing underwater content in MMOs and why? We have Kinetic Fetus here. Kinetic Fetus, he said, I'm neither for or against underwater content. Though more often than not, it blows. Very true. I will agree, Kinetic. As for a mermaid class, Perfect World International has one, so you're halfway there to mer zombie goodness. But the half is not good enough, and I have to ask, when they blow, do they blow bubbles? When they blow? Yeah, because when, when the underwater content blows. Oh, oh. So. Seriously, guys, you're making me sad now. <laughs> when yeah. they blow, I was like, what? We were talking about mermaids, and you said blow. Uh, yeah, I was going somewhere else completely for a moment. <laughs> mermaids. Well, get your minds out of the gutters, folks. But we were talking about mer zombies. Yeah, I think the better term would be mer mer zombs. Like, I just just call them mermaid zombies. It wasn't that hot. Or zombie mermaids. I mean, like zombie mermaids. Is, I'm still waiting for it. Still waiting. Mermaids. Mermaids. Zombies. Zombies. Yeah. Zombies. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to do that. I can't put whoever the two makes words. it gets to name it. There we go. Yeah, whoever makes it gets to name. It. I looked into that and I couldn't actually find because I was like, "What? There's a mermaid class? I've never heard of this." And all I could all, all I could find was an ability called Typhorm, uh, which transforms you into a mermaid in the water. Hmm. You can be an orca or a whale in WoW if you're a druid in the water. Well, sure, sure. Yeah, you can be like that kind of thing. They they've have some transmogs so you can change what you look like. Um, all right, so that is actually the just one quick thing. I just sure. typed in mermaid MMO into Google, uh -huh. and I came up with a site called Mermaid Utopia, which first line says mermaid MMO. Really? So well, there you go. There's a mermaid. Take MMO. that for what it is. <laughs> is there a zombie expansion in that one? I, I don't. There's no more research zombies. is required. Yeah. All right, we'll find out for you guys if there is actually mermaid zombies. There has to be. There, there's got to be some fan fiction mermaid zombies somewhere, like. A zombie wanders into the water, birds bites a mermaid. That mermaid takes it back to her hometown. I'm sure it exists on the internet. Everything exists on the internet. Question of the week for this week is: Do subscriptions of any kind belong in a free-to-play game? I ask this because we've seen several games uh, have subscriptions. Uh, Allies Online just recently got a subscription, but it's separate. Then you have Sotor, of course, which has a subscription. Then they play alongside the free-to-play players and arguably get a lot more than free-to-play players. Um, then you have the ga ga got games like uh, Card Hunter, a TCG that has a subscription that grants players extra items upon completing missions and winning games. So there are several uh, different types of subscriptions out there. And my question to the viewers then is, do you feel like these belong at all in free-to-play? Is there ever a nice sort of... Cohabit cohabitation that can occur between free-to-play games and pay-to-play or just subscriptions rather for free-to-play games that is my question jason kevin you're allowed to make slight responses if you wish no. i'm not a fan that's all i'm gonna say yeah i, I don't mind them you don't no, mind I them? I, I think i might be writing something a little more about that this week all right well stay tuned to mmobomb.com for more information regarding that but in the meantime Go ahead and leave us your responses to the question down below, and I'll be sure to read them in the best fashion possible come next week. Who knows? Maybe if you ask me to read it in a certain tone, I will. I like doing things like that for you guys because you guys are cool, and I like hanging out with you guys here. But all right, 
Moving on, we're going to go ahead and wrap up, I guess wrapping us up rather, that's how we're going to move on. Uh, wrapping up this episode here, of course, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can get a hold of us and what kinds of digital media outlets we actually, I guess, pay attention to. Of course, there's Twitter, at Spunkify for Twitter. Jason Winter, you are at Winter Informal, right? That is correct. Look I at me. Also- are you just gonna do? Are you just gonna do it all? You, you should have it all memorized by now, man. Uh, I think. Okay, let me try. Uh, Kevin, you are no social media. K, you're correct. All right, there we go. I'm three for three at this point. I remember my own, so I count that one too. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I think sometimes uh, Kevin, you do a blog, and you also stream. That would um, be me who does the blog and streams. Yes, you do. That's what I said. Oh wait, no. So said Kevin. Kevin. Oh, sorry. Oh God. Okay. Oh, it really is towards the end of the episode here. <laughs> uh, Jason, you do both of those, but honestly, uh, I, I went, uh, Winter is Coming Something is your blog. Winter Informal. Winter no, Informal? That's, that's my Twitter. My blog yeah, well, is... Oh, you're right. I don't know. Oh, See, please. I can't do it. What's your my blog? My blog is jasonwinter.wordpress.com. Stream at twitch.tv slash jasonwinter. Man, it's so... Very rough. hard to remember. <laughs> like... No, uh, no fantasy infusion at all into any of that. I had that once on my, on my Twitch stream, but then nobody knew who I was in chat, so I was like, "Screw this! I'm just going to use my real name." Jason Winter. All right, well, Jason Winter, thank you for giving us all your information. Now we'll go find you. Uh, but guys, if you guys always want to talk to us, feel free to do so. I try to uh, talk to you guys and just spout randomness, and I'm sure these two dudes do that as well. Um, as always, you can also email us if you wish. Uh, you can email me at michael at moobomb.com. And I'm sure if you want to get a hold of these other guys, you can do so through the official outlets on moobomb.com about us page. Until next time, guys, this has been Spunkify, and I eagerly await to see you guys again soon. Spunkify out. Later, guys.